Well, to begin this morning, I thought it would be fun for all of us to take a trip down memory lane. And specifically in wherever you're at with your age, I want you, to the best of your knowledge, to go back to those fond early years in high school. And specifically, if you can imagine with me for a minute, of going specifically into your English or your language arts class in that freshman or sophomore year. Now, I understand that for some of you to recall that memory is a joyful experience as you loved reading and writing, but for some of you, I'm well understanding that it is a nightmare to go back to that class. Now, regardless of your experience, all of us were introduced to some of the most influential and historical pieces of literature, to name just a few. To Kill a Mockingbird, Lord of the Flies, Animal Farm, or maybe for our thespians in the room this morning, Romeo and Juliet. That was the one you enjoyed and loved. But for me, there was was one that really captured my attention as I absolutely love fiction novels, and I, and I love history, and there was one that kind of blended the two together, and it was the Iliad and the Odyssey. And for me, that epic poem of, of journey and battles and character development um, was something that I just grew in love with, and I was fascinated by the characters of the story And as I became more interested in kind of that genre of literature, I started to do a little bit more study, and it led me to one of the most famous and maybe well-debated stories of history, and that was the destruction of the city of Troy, and how it came to be that this stalwart of a city was destroyed, which is where we see the story of the famous Trojan horse. And if you're unaware of what the Trojan horse was, this was a large wooden horse constructed by the Greek army. And they wanted to use it as a deception tool because for 10 years they were unsuccessful in trying to infiltrate the Trojan city. So they constructed this to deceive them. And and there was one morning where the, the Trojans would go out and find the Greek army have seemed to have been banished, they've left, they're gone, their camp is on fire, and all that was left was this wooden horse. And they thought, well, it was probably their dedication to a Greek god, so they would bring it back to the city as a trophy for their victory over the Greek army. But little did they know that those warriors that were hid in the belly of the horse would come against the city, and at the early hours of the morning, the Greek army, those warriors would come out of the Trojan horse. They would let open the gates to let the rest of their army come in and and the city of Troy would be destroyed. Now, I'm well aware that that could be a myth, that it could be a, a, a figment of my imagination or just a cool story, but the Trojan horse has become an illustration of what can happen when something is destroyed from within. And that destruction can come from within something that seems to be strong, like a a physical body that takes only a few cancer cells to destroy it. Or maybe the famous Trojan horse virus that infiltrates a computer and destroys it. Well, we're going to see that this letter, the letter of Jude, is to be sent out to faithful churches and faithful brethren that are going to be warned that there are going to be people that are seeking to destroy the faith from within the body of Christ. And the consequences are not physical lives, and the consequences aren't a computer virus. The consequences are eternal life. Because these individuals are seeking to distort the true gospel that has the power to save. So let us now turn our attention to these four verses, this introduction of, to the letter, and we're going to examine three things to kind of lay the groundwork to begin our study through the book of Jude. So three things, three points in your notes, if you want to write these down, we will cover the author of Jude, who wrote this letter, what is his background, what is his story, 
Second thing we will look at is the audience of Jude. Who are the recipients of this letter? Is it a specific church or a general church? And thirdly, we will look at the aim of Jude. The aim of Jude. So let's go ahead and look at the first part of verse 1, which is going to introduce to us the author of Jude. First part, it says, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, Jude was a common Hebrew name at the time. This name would have been synonymous with other Hebrew names like Judas or Judah or Judea. But this specific Jude in the first verse is purposely trying to distinguish himself from all others that possess that similar name. Some of the most notable Judases we would know in Scripture are Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples who would betray Christ for 30 pieces of silver and would go on to take his own life out of guilt and shame for his sin. This is also not the other Judas, Judas Thaddeus, who was also part of the original 12. That Judas, the one who is associated with the original 12 disciples, identifies himself in Scripture as the son of James. But as we're going to see, this specific James is related to another James. He is the brother of James. So he uses two forms of identification to help distinguish himself from all the others. First, he puts into high honor his spiritual position. So let's look at Jude's spiritual position. He calls himself a bondservant. And this is not just any bondservant. He gives a, uh, an ending there. He says, I am the bondservant of someone else. I am the bondservant of Jesus Christ. This same title was used by Peter and Paul and James in our New Testament letters as they would introduce themselves. And the purpose behind it was to elevate the person of Christ. It was making a very clear statement that I am placing myself under His Lordship. The term bondservant here is the Greek word doulos, more literally translated slave. And if you have a more recent translated copy of the Legacy Standard Bible, they actually use that term slave slave of Jesus Christ. Now, for some historical context, it's important that we understand that a slave during that time would have never been addressed by their personal name, their primary name. They would have been identified in association with their master. Their master would have had ownership over all of their property, all of their rights, all of their belongings were dedicated to the one who they were a slave to. One commentator said, a slave would have literally been defined as a living tool to be utilized by the owner. So what does Jude say of himself? That he is in fact a slave to the eternal master. The one who he's giving himself up to, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about Jude's story is that he was not always under the lordship of Christ. The Gospels record that this Jude was someone who actually didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah or the Christ during his ministry. So you could maybe make the argument that for Jude, for a very early portion of his life, he was under the control, the lordship of Satan. Matthew 13.55 and Mark 6.3 identify this Judas as being one of the half-brothers of our Lord, along with Joseph and Simon and James, James being the one who would write our New Testament letter, not the James of the disciples. And it is John who gives us insight into the spiritual condition of this band of brothers. In John chapter 7, Jesus is having a conversation with his brothers as they're preparing to head south for Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the tabernacles. And in this conversation, they're they're egging Jesus on to go with them to show off his miracles, to show off his greatness. 
But John inserts this little commentary in verse 4 of John 7. And it says that they were not asking this so that they can show off how amazing Big Brother was and exclaim to the people that the king has finally arrived, the Jews are saved. It says not even his brothers believed. Not even his brothers believed. See, Jude wanted nothing to do with submitting himself and following after the Messiah, Christ. But the Lord had another plan for Jude. We see Jude pop up again in the upper room after the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Acts chapter 1 records this event. And in verse 14, it states that those same brothers, along with the disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were there. And what were they doing? It says that they were devoting themselves to prayer. And it says, this is key to the whole phrase, to see that we have a transformation that occurred after the resurrection in Jude. It says that they were all of the same mind. It's an implication from the text that at this point, Jude was no longer enslaved to the enemy, but was now converted and convinced that Jesus was the Christ and now his master. And what an incredible grace that is. Not only just for Jude, but also for 2,000 years of church history saints, including you and me. That the Lord in his sovereignty moves all of us, for those that are in Christ, out of a spiritual state of unbelief, and he moves us by the power of the gospel to transform us into believing. We go from death to life because of the power of the gospel. We are no longer enslaved to sin. We are a slave, a bondservant to Christ. The second identification Jude uses here is not just his spiritual position, but to link his familial position. So we have both a spiritual position and a familial position. Jude now states that he is the brother of James. This James is also one of the half-brothers of Jesus mentioned in the Gospels, and he also went from a state of unbelief to belief. But what's interesting about James's story is Paul records in 1 Corinthians 15 that James was a witness, an eyewitness to the resurrection of Christ. And James would go on to be a prominent church leader in Jerusalem. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that he's using these two positions in his introduction to distinguish himself from the other Judes or Judases? Well, it wasn't a way to puff himself up of spiritual arrogance. But what he's doing is he's using his position to emphasize the seriousness of the words that are going to come in his letter because the body of Christ at that time needed to be warned of the infiltration of these apostate people, most likely being false teachers. So what he's doing is he's establishing his credibility with the saints and more importantly, placing an important emphasis on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The true gospel that places Christ as Savior and as Lord together. A truth that will be denied by these false teachers, these apostates. Look at the end of verse 4 in Jude. It says that these teachers will be characterized by their what? Denial. Denial. Their denial of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, I have to say that I have a growing concern that we are living in a time and, and watching the churches in our time moving in this direction as well. Now, they won't come out and say that they deny the lordship of Christ, but when you have churches blatantly denying the commands of Christ in his word, when it comes to sexuality and marriage and gender and even qualifications of church leadership, you have to ask, are they submitting themselves to the lordship of Christ? See, to follow Christ, there is a demand from his word that we have to be submitted to. 
It is not just identifying ourselves and saying, yeah, we, we love that Jesus is Savior and we will wave, wave that banner. But it is another thing to come under His Lordship. It demands something from us within the body of Christ. Go ahead and hold your spot and flip in your Gospels to Luke chapter 14. I briefly want to show you that there is a command from Scripture, from Christ Himself, of what it means to be under His Lordship, what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be a disciple. It is not enough just to observe from a distance, to sing a few worship songs, and put the label on your social media platforms that I am a Christian. There is a demand from Christ. And just to provide a small amount of context for this chapter in Luke 14, we're going to see that the, the crowds are starting to grow. They're following Christ. They're loving the miracles. They're loving the performance. And what's interesting is that when Christ has the crowd gathering, that's when he turns it up a notch with his preaching and teaching. And what he's trying to do is he's, he's separate those who are just looking to follow to receive a miracle and those who are going, no, my life now is dedicated to you and following after you. How countercultural is that for churches today? See, we associate the gathering of crowds to be associated with God's blessing. And that if we have the crowds and if we have the numbers, then we must be faithful. But what's interesting is we're going to see Jesus commands something from us when the crowds start to gather. Look at verse 26 of Luke 14. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Continue on. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe him will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. So we have to ask ourselves, was was Jesus making the case that we have to like hate everyone and then that, that's the, our, our start of following him? That's what it means to be a, a faithful servant of Christ? We just go around and start bashing everyone? No, no, no. What he's saying is the relationship and the following, the submission you have with me supersedes all relationships that you have. Your wife, your children, your friends, everything will fail in comparison to what it means to following and submitting yourself after me. So that's a tough question we got to ask ourselves. Are there things in our life that we haven't brought under submission? Do we have relationships that we've elevated over Christ? Let me tell you today, today's the day of repentance. Repent, put him first, and follow after him. Furthermore, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What's the reward for losing our lives? It's eternal life. We gain eternal life when we place him as our Lord. See, the Lordship of Christ demands a complete submission. Your will, your desires, your possessions, your obedience are now placed under the ownership of Christ. See, I can't find anywhere in Scripture that separates Jesus as Savior and Jesus as Lord. You cannot have one without the other. Jesus is not your personal eternal life insurance policy. He's not your get-out-of-jail-free card in the game of life. 
where you just get to go around and do whatever you want because of the grace of God. I get to do whatever I want. See, but the command is that we are to deny ourselves. We have to take up the cross and follow him. I love how a faithful pastor said this years ago, and it rings in my head today. And it's a truth from Scripture. If Christ is not your Lord, he is not your Savior. If he is not your Lord, he is not your Savior. He's not your back pocket, just pull it out when I get into trouble card. Everything that you are demands to be placed under his control. And genuine saving faith for the slaves of Christ will produce over their life spiritual fruit. It will produce a heart not burdened to obey. It will produce a heart that submits to his authority. It will produce a heart that loves the brethren. And it will produce a heart that longs to abide in his word. It's really interesting to hear Christians talk about how they just don't have time for his word. You know, I, yeah, I, I get to it when I can. This is the words of eternal life. Where else would you want to go? How do you know how to obey him? How do you know how to place yourself underneath him if you aren't in his word? You've got to ask yourself, am I in love with him in his word? Because it has eternal life in them. Well, now that we have a firm understanding of the author of Jude, we have to turn our attention to the recipient of the letter, which is the second point in your notes, the audience of Jude. He says, to those who are the called, this is the second half of verse 1, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. There's not enough contextual or historical evidence to say for sure that Jude is addressing a specific church. So his letter throughout church history has been accepted as a general letter to the universal church, that all churches are to pay, pay close attention to the words that he's stating. But what we do know about his audience is that they are genuine believers as he calls them to what? Contend for the faith in verse 3. And there's encouragements that he shares here in these verses to affirm their salvation. He does it in four different ways. First, he says that they are the called. So go ahead and underline that in Jude. If you're not there, go ahead and drop back to Jude. He says that they are the called. This is the Greek word kletos, or more literally translated, the summoned ones. And in context here, Jude is not describing a general group of people who have generally heard the gospel. This call, this group of people have received the internal and effectual call of God. It is the gospel call that God uses to revive a specific group that was predetermined before the foundation of the world that would be set apart for his glory. The Apostle Paul uses this same term in his letter introductions in both Romans and 1 Corinthians. Listen to this. Romans 1. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God and Rome called as saints. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosinus, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. What is the emphasis here from both Jude and Paul? 
that none of us who have been transformed by that internal and effectual call have provided anything for that process to happen. We've provided nothing for our own salvation. We've provided nothing for our own calling to be taken out and plucked out from the word, word from the world for God's glory. No merit, no ability, no righteous deed have been considered worthy to initiate that call. That is reserved from the Lord only. That is His doing. Secondly, He says that they are beloved in God the Father. Go ahead and circle that word, beloved. God has set upon those whom He has called to be the recipients of His unconditional love. A love that has been determined to be set upon us from eternity past. A passage that we studied months ago in the book of Ephesians speaks to this truth. Ephesians 1, 4-5, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of of his will. And let us also be mindful that that love that was bestowed upon us as 1 John 3 1, he calls us now children of God, it required a payment. The love that was given to us required a payment. That is what true love is. Romans 5 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. The love that we received in being a part of the body of Christ as children of God required a payment through His Son. The third description we're given from Jude as to know that they are genuine believers, it says that they are kept for Jesus Christ. Go ahead and circle that word kept. These individuals who are both called and loved are also preserved. They are also preserved. They're given special attention. It literally means to be kept under guard. And who are they kept under guard by? The Father. Reserved as a love offering for His Son. And no one whom the Father draws, He loses. I love how John Calvin describes this eternal security that we have because it is Him who keeps. He says, for we should be always in danger of death through Satan. And he might take us at any moment as an easy prey. Were we not safe under the protection of Christ, whom the Father has given to be our guardian, so that none of those whom he has received under his care and shelter should perish. What amazing comfort. What joy we can have because of that security that it was God's eternal plan for those that are in Christ and Jude would conclude his greeting to these believers with a traditional Jewish greeting where he says mercy and peace and then he would add the word love and it's to serve as a comfort and a blessing for the believers that are experiencing maybe trial in the moment and it goes for us as well as believers today it's to be understood that our life on this side of eternity can be complicated. It can be frustrating as we all battle sin unto glory. And it also can be hurtful as we receive external opposition from the world around us. And it can also be unrewarding at times in the physical sense because of what we seem to have as faithfulness, thinking that we should be rewarded. But the affirmation of their salvation and this blessing from Jude are to be viewed as an anchor for the deepest part of your soul. For when trials and tribulations press in around you, they are to hold you fast. They are to hold you fast. And now that Jude has put in front of his recipients of a reminder of the Lordship of Christ, and the salvation that they have in Christ, he moves into his thesis statement for the letter. He presents to the saints a warning that there will be individuals who will seek to infiltrate the church. And their goal is to sway people away from the truth of the gospel. 
The truth of the person of Christ and the truths of how one should live in light of the gospel. Third point in your notes that we're going to see through verses 3 and 4 is the aim. The aim of Jude. We see in verse 3 Jude's urgent appeal to these believers that there is a battle coming. And that they need to be prepared for what is coming. How do we know that this is an urgent matter for Jude? Because Jude says that it was actually his initial desire to write a letter of rejoicing over their what? Their common salvation. But he makes a shift. And he implores these believers with an imperative, a command to contend earnestly for the faith. He goes so far to say that it was a necessity that he writes these things. The imagery that we can have here for this thesis statement is of a watchman on the tower of a, of a city. And he's looking out on the horizon and he can see an army gathering, preparing themselves to come to battle against his own fortified city. And like any faithful watchman, he's springing to action and he's warning the inhabitants of the city that they are to be armed and ready to defend. And what is the battle that not only these believers face, but also for the saints for the past 2,000 years? It's the battle for truth. It's the battle for truth. Now before we unpack this theme statement for the letter, we have to get an understanding as to the reason why he's writing with such urgency. In verse 4, Jude provides us with four characteristics that mark these individuals that are seeking to kill and destroy. These are the Trojan horses of the church. First characteristic that we see from Jude is how stealthy they are. He talks about them being stealthy. He says that they have crept in unnoticed. See, these individuals at first can fit in really easy. They kind of walk the walk. They talk the talk. They could maybe even slip past a membership interview from a pastor stating a, a generally decent testimony. They may even begin serving in an area and maybe, maybe even showing faithfulness. And who knows, maybe they're even elevated into levels of leadership to have influence over the body. But we're going to see that in the end, their intentions are evil. Their intentions are self-seeking, and they are looking to use ministry of the gospel for their own advantage. So we see that they are stealthy, they're sneaky. Number two, we see that there is an eternal sentence awaiting them. These imitators have been marked out long beforehand for condemnation, as Jude says. Just as the saints were set apart from the beginning of the world, so are also those who infiltrate the bride of Christ with those evil intentions. And they will face inevitable, final judgment of wrath from God. So they're stealthy. They have a sentence. Third, they use the gospel for their own sensuality. They use the gospel for their own sensuality. They're sensual individuals. Jude describes their conducts as someone who is constantly trying to indulge their carnal desires. The term licentiousness speaks of a life of self-abandonment. They have no self-control, especially when it comes to sexual deviancy. Isn't it interesting that we're watching in a time where church leader after church leader, pastor, pastor, church leader, fall into sexual sin, disqualifying them for ministry. And what's sad is that this isn't happening as a one-time thing. This is happening again and again and again from church to church to church. Do we not get it that these are men that are not qualified for the pastorate? They need the gospel because they're showing themselves to be apostate. But a church has to be equipped with truth in order to identify these individuals. Paul speaks to this that these types of men will be an issue throughout church history from the
the time the church began until Christ in His second coming. He says in 2 Timothy 3, 2-5, He says, For the men, for men will be lovers of, of self. They will be lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Here's the key. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And Paul says, avoid such men. Avoid them. Lastly, Jude says that these these apostates, these leaders present faulty statements of Christ. Faulty statements of Christ. Jude says they deny, they completely reject the lordship of Christ. Their only master is the father of lies. And it's interesting to watch the father of lies work through these individuals to sow the tares among the weak. And how does he do it? As 2 Peter 2.1 says that he uses destructive heresies. Destructive heresies. See, these individuals are nothing more than a counterfeit. They're nothing more than a counterfeit. So we can understand why that Jude is calling now a group of blood-bought saints to contend for the true faith of the gospel. The word contend means to struggle for, to fight for, to agonize over the true faith. And in my study this week, my kind of initial reaction to this command was, well, we need to raise up an apologetics army at Shepherd's House. And we need to send them out. And we need to just run everybody over with our systematic theology. Now, don't get me wrong. Having your systematic theology dialed in is important and it is essential to identify those who are in the faith. But Jude's goal isn't to raise up a bunch of theologians who can win a 4,000 character theological debate on Twitter. That's not the purpose. Jude's implore is that the body is to be equipped with the faith, the true gospel, the true gospel that is sinners that are saved by grace through faith in Christ according to Scripture for God's glory. That is the gospel. We must know that the person of Christ, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, who is both fully God and fully man, sentenced to death, became sin on our behalf, bore the wrath of God as a substitutionary atonement for those whom he has predestined to save, and that Christ bodily resurrected three days later to conquer death and has ascended to the right hand of the Father who will come back to rule and reign. And he will eventually judge both the living and the dead. You must know that Christ. That is the Christ of the Word. And we must also know the commands of Christ. We are to live in obedience to His commands that He has set forth in His Word. We do not live aimlessly or carelessly because of God's grace. We live as bondservants to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Contending for the faith is not just a war of words. It's not just theological debates. Now it's important that we stand for truth when someone is in error according to the word of God. And we have to be grounded so that if anyone comes in our midst and is seeking to divide the body with their doctrine of demons, we must be ready. We must be ready to contend, as Paul said to Titus, to refute those who contradict the word of God. But we also need to be people who are living in light of the gospel. It's yes, knowing the truth, but living the truth. So the two questions we have to ask ourselves as a shepherd's house church body in 2023 is this. Is this type of behavior and is this type of teaching still going on today? I think all of us can say unanimously yes. Absolutely. The war on truth of marriage, gender, identity, race, the inerrancy and sufficiency of scripture, salvation, the lordship of Christ is sadly not something we are just experiencing outside of these four walls. 
We're battling it within the quote-unquote church of these issues. Many churches are looking to twist and manipulate the scriptures to build a theology that affirms a perverted lifestyle or making Christ less than what he says he is in his word. Churches that stand and divide the word accurately are sadly now the uncommon. So, how do we prepare ourselves for the war on truth today? Two things, two applications from our text. Number one, we must be students of the word. We must be students of the word of God. Without a filter that is built upon the perfect word of God, any wind of doctrine will easily influence our hearts and our minds. We must be like the Bereans who when Paul came and preached the gospel, what did they do? They looked back at the scriptures and they said, is that true? But sadly, we've just been comfortable of going and yeah, whatever the guy says up here sounds, sounds good. It sounds good. Yeah, you know what? You're right. God would affirm that lifestyle. He does have homosexual believers. Like, that's okay. And what we're watching is churches build a doctrine and a theology to fit that when that is not what God's word says about gender and marriage and race and scripture and his son. Secondly, we must submit our lives to the word of God. We must submit our own personal lives to the word of God. It is not enough just to have your Christian orthodoxy dialed in. Orthodoxy must transform your orthopraxy. See, it was Paul who encouraged the church at Corinth to what? Imitate him as he imitated Christ. And then Peter, in 1 Peter, lays out the bar of what your life is to look like in light of Christ being your Lord. He says that we are to be holy in all of your conduct. Holy in all of your conduct. Public and private. With Christians and non-Christians. The things you say, the things you do. Holiness is the bar. Now, thank God for God's grace that we will fall short even in our converted self. And that's where it covers. But we should be progressing. We should be seeing the Spirit in our lives transform our hearts from the things that we say, the things we do. We're watching ourselves literally become a new creation unto glorification because we have placed ourselves under the Lordship of Christ. My prayer is that this city, this valley, this state, this country, and the world would know that the saints from Shepherd's House Bible Church are men and women who contend for the faith. Amen? Let's pray.